Hello, Namaste everyone. A very, very warm welcome to today's session on the impact investments for the LGBTQIA plus community entrepreneurs. Uh, I will refer to as the community as we believe the community that matters the most. And I really am surprised uh, at the response we have received. I'm very, very happy to be here. It happens to be personally a journey of over a decade for myself uh, in the impact ecosystem and finally bringing together entrepreneurs from the community is a dream come true. And we at Surge Impact cannot be more happy than sharing it, uh, the whole of our work at this forum. So I'll quickly take you through what we are uh, here to do today before I uh, invite my uh, panelists. One second. Yes. So, yes. So, this is one of the research. A lot of uh, different research papers exist uh, that talk about VC funding, but very few pe uh, papers exist that talk about VC funding in the community. Now, one of this is from the backstage capital, and we see that less than 1% actually uh, of the VC funding goes towards the community. And that there are um, a lot more uh, reports that point out to saying how even in the community, that ratio of funding is divided unequally among the spectrum. Now, those of you uh, who will uh, be educated about the spectrum later on will understand what I'm saying. Uh, but here we are basically to talk about why this is happening, how we can overcome this through the following agenda. So I'll quickly take you through what this session is about. I will also quickly uh, tell you about what we are doing at uh, Surge Impact Foundation, the need for impact investments in the community, um, and the journey of rights to empowerment and rights and empowerment together. Uh, the case for impact investments, uh, we will have an entrepreneur speak with us uh, from the community. We will then have a roundtable discussion, a panel discussion um, between few people that have gathered here and those with experience of running enterprises and supporting enterprises in and from the community. And then we will close this panel uh, after that talk and we will take question and answers in between. So very quickly diving it in, I would want to make it clear that this session is all about creating wealth to everybody. It's been ages that uh, since actually uh, the 60s, the fight has been going on when it started with the rights for uh, uh, gay men um, back in the day. But decades have passed, the fight for rights continue. The fights for justice continues, inclusivity in all corners continue. But we are here today talking about how we can look at the community beyond rights, beyond skilling, beyond providing self-employment opportunities to actually enabling them and enabling all of us to thrive in an ecosystem of entrepreneurship that can uh, come through the community. Now, one of the reports estimate that the purchasing power of the community in India, and this is still a conservative figure, stands at more than $132 billion. Now, what happens when uh, it's a very obvious thing when you don't provide the right access uh, to participate in the economy and in the workforce, naturally all of us are affected. So I just want to make it clear that this is not an issue of us or them or them or someone else or who is them, who is us, is not the point here. It's about all of us together and that unless we look at the community from the lens of creating wealth, we are all not generating wealth enough. So in order to do this, uh, what are we doing at Surge Impact Foundation? We have taken the mantle to run the country's first ever incubation program. Just like any incubation program should do, we have two primary objectives to make the entrepreneurs who join our incubation investable. That is most important. But also the second one is to help the entrepreneurs very, uh, who are just starting out to validate their business models and finance models. Now, when I say these things, uh, you would say any other incubator does that. But why do we need to look at the community, especially because there are certain challenges and we will be highlighting that before that. So we are a Section 8 company. And uh, while this program we launched this year, uh, um, last year, actually, you know, uh, last year onwards, we've been talking to a lot of our peer network, a lot of the investors, CSR. 
and we've been working on this project and this year we announced the program and within four months we have gathered more than 100 applications and out of which uh, we will be choosing and selecting uh, about less than 10 applications to start with because that's our bandwidth right now and we will be piloting uh, the theory that uh, enabling entrepreneurship can distribute wealth across the spectrum and also achieve sustainable development goals faster and better. While we are running this program, the few basic tenets of any incubation programs added to our uh, program at Surge Impact also is uh, definitely business coaching. We look at entrepreneurs as individuals full of talent and are taking the maximum risk for all of us. And hence working with them at a personal level is the most important uh, cornerstone for us. Beyond that, we also look at uh, enabling right mentorship. And by right mentorship, we mean the right partners across the industry, the team areas and experience and insights that they can bring to the entrepreneurs. We also look at uh, people to come on board who are experts to take deep dive workshops for these entrepreneurs one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting. There is a lot to learn from the community itself. So there is a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning engagements that we would be uh, uh, conducting. And along with this, while there is a continued alumni support, there is a financial component to the program. We are giving uh, seven and a half lakhs in seed funding to each entrepreneur that is selected and a fellowship amount every month uh, for aiding their out-of-pocket expenses at a personal level. Why we are doing all of this, the reason we are doing this and we would love if hundreds of more organizations do this work and join hands together is that we'll be collectively unlocking the wealth that has not been unlocked yet. In fact, uh, many, many folks, um, whether in the West or the East, have seen the impact of unlocking wealth um, with the community and we want to take that more formal and a notch above. Also the talent. So a lot of uh, members from the community that we met while we were building and designing this program told us that so far the only interventions that have reached out to them is to provide them some bare minimum skilling in order to build some handicraft materials or to put up some products in an exhibition, whether sponsored by the government or in private. Now, that's, that's also an issue, right? Why do we only look at the community from the lens of underskilled or not skilled at all? We have found in our own journey amazing entrepreneurs who are ready to take on any entrepreneur from any class and community uh, in terms of the business acumen, in terms of the risk they are taking and the vision they have for their own companies and teams. So we are inviting all of you to come play with us in working together and unlocking this potential of wealth and talent. Then we come about impact and we talk about impact. Pandemic especially has exposed a lot of issues uh, that have come to the surface, especially uh, in the community uh, because of the discrimination and the non-inclusive nature of policies and relief. Now, when you look at creating entrepreneurs from the community, you naturally make an impact across the board, which otherwise don't exist. Also, Raj, two minutes yes. left. Yes. Also, there is absolutely no data. We have uh, found one of the peer organization, in fact, uh, we have also borrowed some of the words from them, is uh, start out uh, in US. And they also had to do one of their own surveys and research to come up with information on entrepreneurship in the community. Now in India, that kind of data still does not exist. While the government numbers itself about the basic demographic data of the community is contested by the activists, uh, we do not have entrepreneurial data about the community at all. We are also looking at uh, creating that data and we believe that we can achieve that in next one year. Now, also the story as I narrated before, while we focus on this, there is, no, there is nothing more empowering than making someone an entrepreneur and giving an enterprise for them uh, to reach out and uh, to be run. Now, we perceive this journey to, uh, to be happening together, the journey of rights and entrepreneurship, and hence we are here to be presenting. Now, uh, we will be uh, quickly inviting our first uh, speaker from our friends uh, and family, um, Vaiba Modi. Now, a very quick uh, introduction before uh, Vaiba takes on um, the session. 
one second yes so i'm always always happy uh, it's like a personal um uh, wish list to always introduce uh, introduce vibo he's basically identifying himself as an entrepreneur today for us but for me a lot beyond that he's an inspiring individual uh, a kathak dancer a curator uh, of different events if you ever come to hyderabad you will know what i mean by curating experiences and vibo will be talking about that business today uh, he is a man of many talents uh, he also has been working to spread around gandhian values and has reached out to more than 150000 people in india and abroad and he brings a lot of art into the uh, entire experience zone in hyderabad and outside of hyderabad he has performed at some notable uh, places in across the country and has been mentored personally by the likes of shri mohit sridhar uh, who are stalwarts in the classical dancing uh, in india now other than leaving uh, uh, leaving aside all the struggles uh, that he has went through uh we have asked him to kindly share the journey of being an entrepreneur from the community today and uh, without further ado um vibo all yours and looking forward to your, hearing you and uh, greetings to everyone who is logged in it's an absolute pleasure to speak about uh the entrepreneurial journey uh coming from us is i mean it's coming from the lgbtqia background so quickly diving in uh let me let me set the tone um so i am a cisgendered queer person from india a country on mus where 70% of youth workforce a country with the 70% youth workforce read down the law which criminalized homosexuality 4 years ago what that means is that today a queer person can have a dignified and a safe expression of life in this country however it's just not that growing up as a queer person in this country comes up with its own set of let's say quirks you know let me tell you a story of a queer boy the queer boy who was ridiculed for being effeminate at school his teachers and peers only noticed his manners and everything else just seemed to be insignificant while other students were being encouraged this boy felt the time that he opened his mouth he would be mocked at and just to avoid attention and judgment the boy learned not to contribute and not to add value even if he wanted to or even if he was capable to what this story tells us that when we look at the lgbtqia community in comparison with the heteronormative community while all of them go through the same system of education and upbringing the lines or rather the starting lines of both the communities are starkly different 15 years later tired of this constant issue the boy decides to change the equation because he's tired he doesn't want to just constantly be noted for uh, being queer or being you know different so he decides to start bring fresh into the avenue of art night life and culture glad to say that he impacted over 80000 people employed the most diverse and inclusive workforce and has a nationwide footprint while agenda of the lgbtqia inclusion into the mainstream i am very uh, humbled to say that that boy happens to be me and uh, you know it could only happen in this process of reaching out because of the systematic pushing across and not being able to add value uh, just because of whosoever you are even though you knew that you're capable of adding value now uh this process of reaching out to uh, you know this entire thing of setting up a business doing experiences and uh, you know starting the entrepreneurial journey all sounds fantastic we set out on doing something like this but this process was not easy in my process of reaching out to multiple businesses in order to hold hands and make sure that the experiences happen where lgbtqia folks were also included i had to reach out to almost 70 different venues in my own city and very shockingly 69 of them refused on frivolous grounds or even asking questions as basic as what is lgtv what is uh, the impact of the community coming and engaging with our normal crowd uh, you know uh, and and when faced with such questions i i was only riddled and i understood that even 
today the education the stigma the uh, you know the discrimination is so out loud out there that even if a person from the community wants to set the tone right it can be very harrowing and very discouraging in fact uh, there are times that people would not even take you seriously uh, they would rather concentrate on your hand gestures and the way what how you are dressed if you are visibly vulnerable people would concentrate on that rather than the value that you are trying to put on table in spite of the fact that they know the thing that you are talking about or the proposal that you have can really let their businesses and your business grow hand in hand while well, these are our regular day to day challenges which we keep fighting into this ecosystem as being entrepreneurs because and and i'm not diving very deep into it due to due to the uh, you know uh, the lack of time but uh, you know these are things that go through for the community but having said that when we empower someone from the community as they are people who are experts by experience who have understood that what it means to be pushed aside and put in a corner they definitely do not want this to happen for their future generations and hence uh, i could only come this far as a as a personal journey you know the story that i share i could only come this far as i had the privilege and the support time effort and most importantly the resources to take that risk to start a journey to make sure that okay i am going to set the tone right and if that happens to any other person who's from the community i am sure they would also want to do the same and hence i humbly appeal to all the entrepreneurs in my opinion also known as the change makers to educate engage and empower with the lgbtqia community of world by putting your money where your mouth is in order to have a more safe and inclusive future world thank you thank you very much thanks a lot vaibhav it's always a pleasure uh, listening to you and also very very um, educative and i'm sure that all, all of us have um, understood what it takes to be an entrepreneur and also really keen to be part of your journey um and i mean and i'm saying on behalf of all of us at surge impact and sankalp as well so yes uh what we will do is um uh, i would request everyone to drop their questions to vibhav in the chat right now we will collect all the questions and look at them at the end of the panel discussion as well so what i will do is i have three guests uh to invite on the panel discussion and without uh, spending much time i will start introducing each of them so the format is going to be i will be inviting one guest at a time and they will be putting forth their points uh and we'll each take 5 minutes and um in the end we will be wrapping up and obviously 5 to 7 minutes i mean in the end we will be wrapping it up um with uh question answers um and conclusions so yes to start with i would invite um, a very notable person um, from the west of india and a very uh, we are very honored to be uh, knowing sanam gandhi and also potentially working with her as we go along and sanam is a transitioning trans woman and is in the process of her legal change of identity apart from conducting training and sensitization program on gender sexuality and lgbtqia plus spectrum at corporates and many corporates colleges and other organizations sanam is a post graduate post graduate in strategic design for businesses um a course that did not go well as she suffered uh, a lot with gender incongruence social economical and mental health issues during that period of her closeted self she is a passionate fashion stylist and a groomer she is also a theater and performance artist she curates new and recycled art and fashion accessories and sells them to people on the streets or at events as she strikes the conversation about the lgbtqia plus community spectrum and strives to bring positive change for all she is dealing with neurodivergence ocd and other issues that most trans persons face depending on their individual situation and circumstances sanam is here with us today to share uh, a few words about uh, uh, the topic i am especially coming from uh her own journey sanam can you unmute yourself and stage is all yours hi 
I'd like to start with asking how many of you knew that one of the names of a guinea guppy fish is also a rainbow fish. And coincidentally, I'm feeling like a guppy in a shark tank here. <laughs> a little nervous. So seven years ago, it wasn't any tank. I found myself in a parking, in a garage. Uh, I was, I had lost my job. I was disowned by my family. I was attacked by goons who tried to rape me. And all of this because I was a trans woman. I am a trans woman. I came out there seven years ago. I started my transition. Uh, one thought kept ticking in my mind was my family told me that we cannot accept you because society won't approve of what you are. And my journey started that way. I thought if the society is the problem and they are not allowing my family to accept me, then I need to uh, talk to society, not understanding how I'm going to talk to 1.38 crore population of India. But then I started off. I had to simultaneously earn my livelihood. So my plan was to sell small handmade accessories, clothing items, door to door outside corporates, as uh, Raj said, and all centralized people at the same time. So journey started around five years ago. I was invited by Accenture to have a session for them to centralize. And then other corporates followed. Any brain, I sensed people for health, agency, hotels, uh, different NGOs. I collaborated with and took sessions, put up stalls, did a lot of theater performances, and I'm happy to share that till now I have sensitized fifty thousand plus people. And all of this I am doing from a mobile phone because I couldn't afford to have a laptop yet. All my money that I'm earning is going into my living, and transition is really very expensive. Uh, one opportunity I see here, when we look at the statistics, the 2011 uh, Indian census says that there are 4.88 lakh transgender people in India. Now we are in 2022, and I don't really agree with the data, because if you look at the American data, for example, they say 0.5% of population is trans population. Uh, by that data, India should have at least up to 70 lakh transgender, if not at least 50 lakh transgender, and that's a huge untapped pool of human resource, uh, resource which we should look at. Uh, the other opportunity I see is about, when we talk about sustainable development goals, uh, how about equal and socioeconomic development by not only enabling job opportunities, but also having business opportunities for people from the community. I'll quickly focus only on two of the challenges that I, uh, two or three challenges that I personally face. Since Raj mentioned I'm going through a legal change of identity, I'm working on it from three years. Uh, had to go to Delhi for it. Now new laws are there on paper. On paper, they look really nice, but in practicality, they are not really helpful. So there are three aspects. One is uh, funding the cost of transitioning legally, the money that is required. Second, the time that is required and uh, the resistance from government and private bodies, wherein people don't want to support when we are doing it there is a resistance uh, i had to visit bank for example i mean understand you'll have a proper identity understand you'll have my bank account how am i going to do the business how i'm going to pay the tax how i'm going to do anything that for that matter uh, so i had to visit bank for almost 30 times to get my identity corrected it showed two names for long uh, still there is some left uh, for educational departments i visited two times to deputy director of education uh, I visited university, I visited uh, the board. It's been 12 rounds and only 50% work is done. So the amount of time that is going in, I mean, uh, eight days ago in the director's office, one person refused to shake hands with me. I wanted to thank him. And then I realized, oh, I'm a trans woman. And why would he shake hands with me? Because I'm a trans woman. So that's the kind of a discrimination we are um, having in the society. The other challenge I like to highlight is uh, being an independent trans woman, not being a part of a uh, you know, this uh, community to Indra call a uh, cultural community of a Hijra community. So when we talk about LGBTQIA+, uh, as uh, Vaibha mentioned, it's either a LGTV or a little better now, okay, people will say, Achha, it is about gays and lesbians. And then we, when we shake people, there is T also in that abbreviation, transgender. And the moment we say transgender, what people picture is here, a Hijra community, which is Fine, because it's the largest community in India of transgender people. But what independent transgender people like me? What about trans men? What about non-binary people who don't want to join a particular cultural community? 
so i like to conclude by saying that uh, we exist we do exist and if i have a minute more i like to share one more uh, challenge that uh, one of, one of the you know most literate considered to be one of the most literate state their literacy rate is 96.2% and one of the sample study they found that 6 out of 10 trans people are school dropouts so the harassment and bullying at the school really pushes trans people outside the education system and if there is no education there are no skills if there is no mentoring how you know we're going to take up not the business but even a job so the opportunity it's a challenge but it's an also an opportunity to invest in the education of trans people from this country for the yeah sustainable social economic development of the south of the globe thank you thank you very much sanam i know um, you have a lot to say and in fact i know thousands of people who attend to listen to you speak and uh, the stories you bring in from the grassroots and the force that you speak out has been always educative and inspirational at the same time thanks a lot again uh, for putting your points i do have few points at the end while i summarize and uh, we will uh, wait for the questions uh, to come in for you as well thank you once again um with that i would like to introduce our second uh, panelist today patroni chidananda shastri a drag performer and founder of dragwanti i know i'm creating a little bit of fomo here by saying all of the action is happening in hyderabad but obviously you should once watch patroni perform and you will know what i mean when i say a big fomo uh, uh, that exists when you don't see him uh, patroni uh, chidananda shastri She is an expressionist dancer, performance artist, and a tranimal drag performer. Patroni started dancing at the age of seven, and his unique style called expressionism is a new way to tell stories of awareness to society. Patroni Shastri contributes his attribute of dance and drag in many national and international avenues. Patroni's work always had interdisciplinary to create a new pedagogy of performance. Patroni performs drag in a unique interpretation of art. that promotes avant-garde art anti beauty and a postmodern approach to art sometimes with dance and other times with folk music uh, and in fact uh, patroni some of the uh, performances have gone viral many times uh, he has also i've seen recently uh, doing folk music in a metro station uh, they have performed in over 1000 shows 50 workshops have spoken over 5 tedx speak, uh, talks um many fashion walks and digital performances across all mediums uh, patroni may i invite you to please put put forth your speech thank you hey thank you so much raj for that wonderful introduction and uh, i'm here in this particular dress specifically in red so that i don't kind of lose your attention for the next you know 7 minutes when i'm going and speaking so uh, let me start with sharing a kind of an anecdote of something which my grandfather used to say so whenever i was uh, a child uh, i was not kind of waking up early or kind of doing stuff my grandfather used to quote a uh, verb which says early to bed early to rise makes a man healthy and wise underline makes a man healthy and wise and uh, you know this is the same quote which all of us might have seen either in our corporate offices or as an email when it comes to our wednesday uh, you know wisdom wednesdays every week having said that uh, you know this quote is something which is most atrocious uh, written by uh, you know benjamin franklin uh, you know the reason is because uh, i doesn't associate with the quote because i'm a trans non binary people and mr benjamin is not talking about me secondly uh, you know within the ecosystem of india which is working majorly with uk uk and us and canada the time zones are something which will not let an employee you know sleep early and wake up early so uh, none of them is something which is associating or kind of uh, making me inspired from this particular quote um, so coming back uh, to the quote um, you know our diversity and inclusion practices are as equal as that of this benjamin franklin quote um, they are just saying speaking and spotting having uh, you not doing anything which is basically kind of coming and you know presenting it to people let me point out to you what are the things which we are failing at firstly our inclusion efforts are taking an easy route of pink washing we are just saying we are just showing but not doing it we are interested or investing in trainings but our staff is not trained 
to show empathy towards people who are from the queer community or queer customers. We are investing in tradings, but uh, you know, it's not going ahead to the grassroots level. With all this, what we need to understand is like we are using the product uh, development language, the waterfall approach to diversity and inclusion, whereas inclusion is something which is more of an agile. Uh, as when we go ahead and kind of recorrect our times uh, to kind of match with our clients and customers sitting in the US and UK, might that be for a daylight saving or may, might that be for you to kind of be more productive? It's really important for us to change our lenses as well when we are kind of going ahead and working with diversity and inclusion. And how can we do that if you're asking that question? So the answer is quite simple. Uh, diversity and inclusion is more of a you know it's it, more of a methodology than that of a framework it's more of something which is more behavioral than that of just putting a ppt and asking them to read uh, so um, when you have to connect personally with each other the best tool to utilize is art so art can dive in into personal spaces and provide information or provide details of how you should show empathy or how you should bring people together in a far more different way. Here are some ideas which I would like to throw uh, where you can utilize art and business together. Use queer artists such as drag performers and drag queens to run your inclusion models. Like they will give you a real-time effort as well as a performance as well as experiences because they are queer. Secondly, they become your inclusion PPTs, which can attract and give the message in a far more clearer way. Make queer artists a part of your business ecosystem and ensure that they are showcasing and calling out the policies which are there within your own system. Uh, ensure that uh, you know these, these policies are placed from day one of an employee's work life cycle. Like imagine a drag queen going ahead and doing a, you know, a, a new joinee's orientation or, uh, you know, doing a language training program. So that is where you give the effort, you bring a human and put it in the system and ask them to lead the inclusion language before. Um, thirdly, uh, get an artist on board, try running mock modules or mock calls, uh, act out scenarios, emphasize on practicing than that of reading about gender neutral language and pronouns. So this is something which would help them in tuning while they are going, going ahead and presenting in their own workspaces. Run something like a pronoun drill, just like a fire drill, where you give opportunity to, to change their pronouns in their own profile of your employees time and again. It's not that you know, a person has to go through an HR and then kind of bring it back. Make it more organic, make it more, uh, you know, I would say, um, open for them to kind of put it whenever they kind of feel in. Uh, finally, uh, you know, ensure that your gender uh, as well as, you know, sexuality policies, which are there, uh, is provided to each and everybody. Ensure that you have a queer audience in place as well and try to educate uh, your system with more of uh, a behavioral change than that of, uh, you know, just, just practicing or kind of telling it out in public. Ensure that it's not happening only in June month. Uh, it's happening over all the calendar and bring people together time and again. So I hope I had my say. And one last thing is like follow queer influencers on LinkedIn because they share better quotes than that of Benjamin Franklin. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Patruni. As, as usual, I was trying to note down a few things and always running behind. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely to the point. And uh, nobody could have said it better, Patruni, that uh, these points, uh, we do hear them even uh, when we go and uh, discuss in a bunch of corporates and with the peer entrepreneurs. Uh, but yes, um, points well made and I'm looking forward to what questions we might get from the folks who understood uh, deep enough. So yes, um, moving to the next speaker, we have, and again, a reminder for those who are asking questions to leave them in the chat box, we'll be collecting and answering them at the end of the panel. And with that, the final panelist we have uh, is one of our partners. And very good partners indeed, uh, who have taken equal risk and a lot of future vision to be carried to dive into doing more than token philanthropy and token uh, responsibility and dive into taking uh, head on the challenges of inclusive development. I'll invite uh, Dr. Meenu Bambani, VP and Head Corporate Citizenship and uh, Guide APAC at State Street. Dr. Meenu Bambani is a CSR and DNI professional with over two decades of experience in human development and social policy. 
by listening to Dr. Meenu, you will realize how uh, she cuts across sectors and cuts across segments of social policies and actually takes us through a journey of interrelated subjects. A fellow of the International Ford Foundation, she has worked in academia, government and non-profit sector and the World Bank. Currently, Meenu heads corporate citizenship and global inclusion, diversity and equity, which is called GUIDE, for State Street Corporation in APAC. Before joining State Street, Meenu spent over a decade at Emphasis, where she was instrumental in creating opportunities that provided high-profile recognition opportunities for their programs, especially around addressing systemic challenges to disability inclusion. And when I say the diversity of experience that Meenu brings in, you can only listen from Meenu's mouth on different work that have happened in the last two decades through her leadership and initiative. Uh, Meenu, all, all yours. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, I'm very humbled to be uh, in this session. And I know I only have five minutes. Uh, so I will quickly come to the point. Uh, however, just one, one quick thing that I wanted to mention that, you know, when we talk of diversity, when we talk of diverse experiences, um, I bring in that from a disability perspective. So Raj already mentioned that. However, just for the uh, knowledge of audience, I have the lived experience of disability and I have experienced and I continue to experience discrimination and exclusion on a day-to-day -day basis when I travel, when I step out of the house and it's just written everywhere. So I can fully understand what uh, people like me uh, or people who are disenfranchised, who do not have, um, who are at the margins go through. Uh, so from a, uh, you know, CSR perspective, uh, you know, we have strongly believed that CSR can be used strategically to bridge the gap that exists in the environment in empowering and enabling the communities to access resources and opportunities. Uh, at State Street, we started by applying an equity lens to our grant making. So for example, in North America, after the Black Lives Matter, we, we boldly announced the 10 actions that how we are going to respond to this uh, and the grant making program went into a through a complete overhaul and in an increasing percentage grants are now invested in organizations that are BIPOC led by BIPOC. I mean, uh, those of you who are not aware or who may not be aware is black indigenous and people of color. Uh, so the organizations that we are funding are led by them uh, and they have adequate representation at leadership staff board and trustees level, building on a strong foundation of serving 85% BIPOC individuals uh, as verified by an independent audit. In India, we were conscious that we need to apply the same approach and explore partnerships that address the issue from an equity lens, uh, especially in the area of education and workforce development for the disenfranchised uh, groups. So Surge Impact's uh, initiative to run an incubation program to support LGBTIQ, QIA plus uh, uh, social enterprises through incubation and network support was one such program that we actively sought. Uh, Raj has already highlighted the uh, aim uh, and the objectives of that. However, from our perspective, you know, this is the first time that something like this is being tried. And we feel that this will be a learning, not just for us, but for the whole social and impact sector. We have to take some step at some point and ensure that we have the patient capital to see through the impact. We understand that the matrix cannot be the same as a regular for-profit enterprises where we measure growth, quarter on quarter, but in this case, uh, what we are trying to see is, or how we will see it is, did we move the needle? Or how we are moving the needle? How are we nudging the sector to take collective action and apply a social justice equity lens to any or group that has remained off the radar of CSR? We are in this journey to find some answers together. 
so that's it from me thank you thank you thank you dr meenu yes i don't think uh, uh, dr meenu that uh, anybody else would have said it better the role and the lens that you wear at uh, state street and especially um, and how so many development initiatives that you have foreseen and have conducted are interwoven and impact the community at large thank you so much uh, for all of your conversations and uh, talks uh, by all four of you and what i will do is there are few questions in the chat box let's uh, directly address them and unless they are pointed to uh, one person specifically i would uh, start by taking them on and please feel free to jump in after that um so the first one i can see is what role can the private sector play in creating an enabling ecosystem for entrepreneurs from the lgbtqai plus community to grow and scale their enterprise i think partly what meenu was mentioning about uh, and also the journey of uh, the uh, development from a corporate lens uh, does answer part of this question uh, but i would always i would also say private sector beyond uh, a corporation right like uh, i had a professor in in my social enterprise course the professor used to say that at the end of the day when you look at csr you also need to know the business of a business is to do business uh, it's not to do impact uh, yet we know that an impact needs to happen because uh, there is a, a community of folks there are people around the world who are left out from the rapid growth uh, that is propelled by uh, the uh, economy's uh, growth uh, by the corporations around the world but i would also say that the private sector um, other than the corporations which also includes not for profit sectors um, and government also uh, even though uh, they are uh, not investing capital directly there is a bigger role to play uh, more than the role i would also say the urgency uh so we have to start by providing basic infrastructure in place i think it is quite established right now in our panel as well that we have uh, a lot of entrepreneurs waiting i think the basic infrastructure is something we can focus on at here i'll take a pause anybody from the panel also wants to address it go for it or we'll go to the next one just to make it fun i'll do some counting um okay all good oh, thanks that is great way patroni to so uh, if you are good with that question <laughs> we improvise all right so uh, jaya jain is asking what are the challenges faced by the community towards accessing investments from financial institutions in addition to the work undertaken by surge would you know of any more targeted investment initiatives and programs so the simple answer to the second part of your question is no we don't know anybody else targeting investments and that is a unfortunate situation we really wish there are thousand more initiatives in the sector uh with or without us and we would being a not for profit be happy to share all of our data with anybody who wants to support the community uh through investments um now uh we know only one institution called start out in us uh we have also reached out to them uh for collaborations and they have done a good study and have supported over 100 entrepreneurs from across the united states of america who are from the community um now other than that the usual other than the usual challenges let's assume the bottom of the pyramid as uh, ck prahlad sir mentioned um uh, exists right the collateral the bank ability uh, the lack of education uh, as entrepreneurship is a loan journey and all of those points that we typically hear in any other sankalp session as well those all exist i and more i and more that we discussed by our panelists also the discrimination the lack of confidence uh, the alienating nature of businesses in b2b settings i and the trust of the uh, consumers and customers so these are also in addition and that is why the focus that's why we are having this session today that it's not a regular incubation program we need to do beyond so anybody else wants to add in fact vibo do you want to add yes patruni you had the hand raised do you want to add some more yes uh, one more thing is like when we kind of look into entrepreneurs like i will take the example of vibo uh, you know because he's my friend and he will not 
kill me for that <laughs> so uh, basically you know like the idea of fitting in a product like you know fitting in a product to the heteronormative one because people still have a lens that uh, you know it's uh, the 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 larger audience or, or the consumers are somebody who are majoritively uh, you know heteronormative and uh, trying to fit a queer product or something which might be you know queer inclusive uh, to the heteronormative crowd is something sometimes uh, you know uh, a challenge as well uh, the reason why i wanted to take uh, you know web have uh, you know initiated is like they, they curate uh, you know events which are uh, you know on the source of or on the, on the basis of queer people so these are queer nightlife events which are being created in this particular city but are still uh, the, the first kind of a stigma which we get from uh, you know spaces uh, which are taking uh, or kind of giving us is like you know it's not catering to the whole uh, you know whole community of heteronormative it's just catering to a certain section of it so uh, it's like you know there's still a kind of a uh, effort of fitting a product to a certain kind of a you know to to a kind of a market and trying to ensure that the heteronormative uh, or the heteronormative crowd is getting uh, uh, mostly benefited than that of the queer crowd so i think customizing a product or customizing an experience is something which is more required and we have to also ensure or consider that there are queer people on the other side who are the consumer base who are kind of taking it or who are kind of uh, wanting to have that particular experience Thanks thanks Patroni yeah may, makes a lot of sense absolutely that that perspective was missing so far actually um yes uh, uh vibhav you also had admitted yeah yeah so i just adding to patroni's point i think what and i'm speaking more from a very basic perspective uh, apart from whatever points that the lower rung of the pyramid that you mentioned uh, it is also lack of data i don't think uh, we know the extent of the community and the need of the community that exists in the market today there is so much like we would know and and i was reading this uh, statistic this is from ipsos uh, survey that happened out of the us that apparently 19% of india's population comes under the umbrella of lgbtqia plus community and that mind you is a huge population even if the number is here and there it's a it's a big number and that is that is a good consumer entrepreneur talent all kinds of pool for you for you to work and see but having said that we still do not see initiatives which work with the ground root with just which works with the community state up it is always hard hidden under the garb and please do not uh, you know misunderstand me when i say this it is always uh, you know hidden under the garb of csr uh, it is not i mean and and from the from the from the community perspective we don't want charity we want equality uh and i'm not trying to disrespect csr what i'm trying to say is that that entire lens of understanding where people have to move and understand that yes there is value there is uh you know uh the same certitude needs to be put into place for the community as it is put for the heteronormative community uh having said that again the disclaimer that i'm not trying to say that csr is not important but yes it needs to be seen as a business as a business lens as raj was also pointing out and that again that that tiny bit of understanding is i feel is also a challenge right there where community feels a little uh, under confident uh, in in really coming out and doing things so yes got it got it um yeah thank you thank you vibhav for adding in uh, Yes, I I think uh, we we'll just go to the next uh, question. Um, in fact, I'd say, Doctor Meenu, if you want to take this, uh, it's addition to your uh, point of connecting equity with the presence of BIPOC founders in the enterprise. How can this lens of inclusive hiring be brought in for larger corporations? Uh, I'd be great to hear you. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Um. so you know larger corporations in any case um uh, are focused on inclusive hiring um there are struggles there are challenges uh in, in whether it's disability whether it is lgbtiq qia plus uh whether it is veterans whether it is any other diversity uh you may uh, talk about um it boils down to a lot of policies inclusive policies inclusive practices and in my observation working with a large corporation now uh 
there are a lot of regulations within many countries uh, within which you have to operate. So uh, the challenges that I see, for example, in Asia Pacific, uh, sometimes there are regulatory requirements where, because of regulations, you cannot allow people to self-identify because those categories are prohibited uh, by law, uh, not recognized by law in some of some of the countries. Uh, so how do you create an inclusive environment? So while at the global level, uh, you are announcing and you are saying that we are inclusive, but you are also tied down by some of the regulatory requirements in many countries. Uh, it needs a holistic approach. Uh, so it is about working closely with the ecosystem. Uh, unless the corporations work with the ecosystem, with the with the groups uh, who, who have remained at the margins, who have remained disenfranchised. You know, you are doing a kind of tokenism. And which is where, uh, you know, I feel that having representation, having participation from all those groups uh, in a structured way with a framework so that you're not all over the place, but you're being conscious uh, and collaborative in making sure that your practices are inclusive. So that's what I would like to add. Got it, got it. Yeah, I think uh, that's about it. To be honest, I was thinking this, uh, that's a point well made. I was wondering if Sanam, you also have any point around that. Uh, I know we have come across together initiatives which are also trying to achieve the same. Um, but yeah, if you do have any point on that. Uh, not to this, but actually the previous question that struck me sure, sure. about having challenges in terms of getting investment. So before I heard of Surge Impact Foundation and this program, I did try to arrange uh, funds for myself. I'll give an example. As I was working, uh, working on the laptop, it's difficult for me for six, seven years and now I wanted to get a laptop very badly. I tried to get a loan, but I was refused three times from the bank and there is no reason given. So it's a very small thing because if anybody can get the loan of probably one lakh rupees to get a laptop, if trans person is rejected three times without giving any proper reason and people who are in between with whom I'm interacting, uh, definitely they don't have any policies in place. So uh, it's like, I mean, if someone wants to speak nicely, they'll speak nicely. Otherwise, someone doesn't want to speak nicely, they'll not speak nicely. There are no reasons given and it's outright like rejected. So yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes to challenges, now Surge is doing a great job. It's the first it's kind of an initiative, but then otherwise, obviously, I mean, raising funds is like depending on allies or asking people and yeah, there is no proper source or channel to, you know, raise the funds for uh, investment in what you're doing. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam. Thank you very much also for the nice comment and uh, absolutely uh, can't be said better. I will move on to this question next, um, Sanam. Uh, so this Abhijit Das has asked about LGBTQ participation is currently trying to achieve what women uh, groups um, have tried to achieve long time ago. Uh, can we start a massive talent celebration initiative rather than projection of this group as an oppressed party? So I would like to invite the panelists also. But before that, I would also say that um, uh, on a lighter note, uh, yes, there are already successes um, uh, from the community of being entrepreneurs. The most valued company in the world, um, CEO Tim Cook, has come out um, and we have all seen the impact of that. And to celebrate, I would say all of us should be getting an iPhone. Uh, but I'm just saying that on a lighter note, I do think there's definitely one of the core tenets of uh, the incubation program at Surge Impact Foundation is be able to dance uh, and the experience curated by Vibo. And we will be celebrating. Absolutely. We are on a journey, all of us together, and we are uh, going to celebrate not just uh, the achievers, but also celebrate the aspirants for joining our programs and elsewhere. Uh, Patroni, you had a point. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's something which is, you know, really interesting about this question. There are two points which I would like to throw. Firstly, it's an oppressed group. Yes, it's an oppressed group. We have been oppressed for, you know, a hundred years now. And till today, uh, you know, this has been a situation uh, where I can't come out in my workspace or, you know, a lot of other people can't kind of come out in a workspace. It looks like a very sad story, but we are tuned to Bollywood. Uh, thank God Bollywood has a lot of, you know, queer stories which are crying each and every point in time. Hence, we are also kind of, you know, got into the same tune, might be uh, habitually. Having said that, um, you know, uh, even 50 years after women, we still kind of go into a, a, a training room and 10 or 15 guys kind of sit and only talk like, you know, hi, ladies and gentlemen, or something like, oh, bro, or chairperson. Those are the words which are still being used. Like, are women getting the, the kind of, uh, you know, spaces which they get? No. Then you can, you can definitely imagine about men. And regarding the talent, yeah, we have wonderful talent. Uh, however, uh, you know, it's it's a hard time for us to kind of uh, come back and take those positions and, uh, you know, start 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 being celebrated. Uh, having said that, uh, what I can kind of suggest is one thing which we all can do um, as as, a, as persons who are investing in business or as, as a corporate employee, like uh, ensure to change ourselves first, like to see our visions in certain way where we include people. Like if you see the world happily, you will not see, uh, you know, the crying stories anyway so i think that is the best way of doing it uh, and uh, i just uh, you know kind of agree with sanam and other people who, who point out challenges even today if a queer person is being hired like for example a trans person a hijra person uh, who has been hired they, they still have to go through a lot of background checks uh, which is one of the example of you know pointing out like what exactly is the kind of oppression which we get uh, and those are some of the things which we are trying to highlight at this point in time uh, hopefully we have a better story hopefully we have more enjoyable stories tomorrow or the after i have a really happy story by the way but having said that uh, it, it's changing the perspective is definitely changing we will definitely celebrate as and when we go forward Go for it, Weber, quickly. I just want to quickly add and thank you, Patroni, for putting this out so nicely and so rightly. I think uh, this very fact that, yes, this is the ground reality. And trust me, if the community does not tell you that this is what is wrong, I don't know what to do, right? In fact, this is why we are here. This is why the community needs to tell you right in your face that here, this is what we are going wrong. Because people come and ask us, what is even wrong? Why are you even fighting? Why is it a mutiny? And this is exactly the same very reason. Celebrating talent, yes, is important. Set putting role models definitely is important. But only those are not the community. The community is by and large existing of so many people who don't even wish to even come out and tell people that this is who I am. And why should that need be required? It should be just a blanket thing. No one comes and asks this heteronormative person that are you straight? Are you, are you, you know, uh, but, but for, for the larger impetus, yes, for me as an LGBTQIA member, I dream of a world where I do not have to put my sexuality in front of my work. It doesn't have to come there. And that is when it'll happen, when people automatically stop making it a big fuss, when we come to an equal and an inclusive world where we do not have these challenges that we are trying to probably highlight and seek help with, but not desperately. Thanks. Thanks, Vaibhu. That almost sort of has concluded on a very uh, relevant note. I'll just quickly uh, finish within a minute uh, just to conclude and uh, let the attendees also go um, to other sessions. We did discuss today the basics. Uh, for those uninitiated on why impact investments matter in the community. Uh, we have seen the journey of Vaibha Modi as an entrepreneur, Sanam's war over inclusion, uh, war for inclusion um, the, among corporates and the uh, rest of the folks. Um, uh, Patruni to have shared about why certain traditional approaches like the waterfall approach, I love, love that analogy, don't really work uh, best. And Dr. Meenu for highlighting all the initiatives and the logic behind why a CSR does what they do uh, in supporting the community. A quick call to action that uh, just to highlight that entrepreneurs and successful leaders in the corporate have always existed from the community. It is not new. It's the time for the investors and the ESG and impact investors to take note and unlock this wealth from the creators, wealth in all angles, impact as well. Now, there's an urgent need uh, definitely to rework on the DNI initiatives uh, in the investor groups as well as the corporates. Uh, now, we also uh, learned how a corporate can get involved. Now, lastly, I would say 
if there is one thing you want to take back from this initial uh, this panel definitely start by investing investing and investing in the community um help us and many other folks to put together more research and data uh, let us run more programs for the community i'm sure there are folks who can do more diverse and better programs as well connect us to more people in the community that you know of and we are looking for volunteers csrs investors and more entrepreneurs from the community on that note i would like to um, say my goodbyes and also very quickly say that uh, it is only one tim cook uh, that uh, we have highlighted in this session there are a million others waiting to be highlighted and uh, join us to discover all of them so thank you so much for all the panelists um everybody who joined us today and back to the sankal team thank you so much